Brother Nathan Morton is coming to preach this morning. Would you lift your voices, lift your hands, lift your hearts. Brother Morton, come preach the gospel to us today in Jesus' name. That's right. Let's worship the Lord. Everybody. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, it feels like Pentecost in here today. That's right. Let's lift our voices. Let's praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, there's a praise in the house this morning. Lord, go among us. Move among us, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, here we are. Let's turn to Judges chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I, uh, I am privileged to be here. I mean that. And I'm not a long-winded preacher. And so get in fast or I'll be all done. And you'll just be getting started. But I do appreciate the honor to be here and to work with all of these men on the youth committee and the executive council. I do appreciate it. But what I appreciate most of all is the good spirit that is in this house. Started last night. It is carrying on this morning. And you all make it easy to minister and get in the spirit. I appreciate the hunger and the desire that is here. I was mentioning to some of the youth committee members last night, I said, I want you to look around this building, clear to the back, clear up in the risers. When it was time to worship, when it was time to pray and seek the Lord, everybody was doing it. There were no dead spots. There were no disengaged people. Thank God for it. There's something going on among the church of God. There's things happening. And we want to be a part of what is going on. Judges chapter 2. I'm telling you, it's miserable being fat. But I've been fat so long now that I wouldn't know how to be skinny. Well, that's right. Brother's with me. Come on. I spent, I spend my time pulling my pants up. I tried suspenders, but they'd come loose. Give me a concussion because they were under pressure. <laughs> I had to have OSHA approved suspenders. So anyway, yes, it's going to be one of those kinds of services. Verse six of Joshua or Judges chapter two. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation that were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Today when I look around and I see, I see many of our our champions, our Joshua's, those that uh, have brought us into a land. A lot of this, folks, that we sit in here tonight, uh, we, we, have, we are living off of the fruits of battles that former generations fought. And all of us are connected to a history. Whether or not we realize it, it is there. And I look around and I see a lot of these elders, and I mean it in, in, with great respect. And gray-headed and um, don't have don't have the youthful energy that they used to have and there's something that stirs way down deep in my soul because I realize that the preservation of any generation depends upon its champions depends upon those that take up the cause and I feel like that today not just at peak but in the church of God at large 
that uh, there's a search going on for another generation of champions. And, uh, and I feel like today, God is even moving in this house. And I don't mean champions in the sense of visibility, position, status, superficial things. I'm talking about those that can even be a champion in obscurity. And uh, David was a champion before they ever knew about him. Before he ever met Goliath, he was a champion. Before he ever got out on that battlefield, he was a champion and nobody ever knew about it. And uh, there, is a, there is a passage here that we read. And it said, there arose, verse 10, another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And today I want to look at that scripture, but I want to preach to us from my heart. I want to preach to us what I feel like God would have us have for today. And it is not just for today's service, but I believe there's something we need to carry away from this service. There is an experience in God that we need to carry away. I want to preach today, defy the decline. Defy the decline. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now, and I'm praying that something would awaken in this house. Lord, that you would put things in motion right now, God, for what you want to accomplish in this generation to which I'm preaching. God, I pray right now that we would get beyond, that we would get beyond what we see, that we would get beyond the pressure that is around us the things that we are surrounded with, and make some decisions today, God, that are going to reach into the future and make a difference. But it will happen today with what we do today. I pray that someone would catch hold and catch fire in this place, that there will be a convergence, a coming together of one heart and one mind, a new birth of a new generation. I pray in Jesus' name, God, I know you have dealt with me and talked to me. I know the burden that's in my heart this morning. And I pray that there will be a transference uh, in this house. Uh, I pray, God, today, uh, I believe, Lord, there are things in motion. Come on, pray with me. I believe there are things in motion. I believe there are things that you've already put in place and prearranged uh, and positioned uh, for this uh, generation. And, Lord, I'm fighting today so that those things do not slip. I am, I am laboring today in the Spirit so that we grab a hold of those things and hold fast on those things lest they slip. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Be long before we reach Judges chapter 2, this all started. Things were already in motion long before we get here to Judges chapter 2. Moses hears a voice of the Lord out of that burning bush. And uh, that is what began most immediately what began, even though we're years, decades removed from that moment. Moses hears that voice out of the burning bush. And we know he marches into the courts of Pharaoh and says, let my people go. I don't know when it happened. I don't know when the connection took place. The Bible does not reveal that to us. And I'm always amazed when I read this scripture at the things that are not told. There's a lot of things I want to find out when we get to heaven and are able to uh, quiz some of those that are there. I don't know what sparked it, don't know what made it happen, but there was something in Joshua that that Moses looked down and saw. There was something in Joshua, and there was something in Moses that sparked an interest in Joshua. Something passed between them. There was a transference between them, and Moses realized uh, what resided in Joshua. I don't know where, don't know how, but we understand that Joshua receives from the Lord. It wasn't a man-made thing. It wasn't something that uh, was done even democratically. Uh, From the Lord, we see uh, later on as we read about Joshua's ministry and, and as he begins to be the conquering leader of Israel, the Lord had transferred from Moses to Joshua that mantle of leadership. And as we read here in Judges chapter 2, 
Joshua's contemporaries who lived beyond his 110 years. They carried on what had begun so long before when Joshua went down to Pharaoh and said, Look, we're leaving. The Lord has said, Let the people go. Then the word of the Lord makes a record of a generation who knew those, who knew those folks that knew the Lord. But they did not have that relationship themselves. And let me just pause here a moment and say I do get concerned about a museum mentality in Pentecost. A museum mentality where people just stroll around casually and ponder. That's what a museum is. They muse over artifacts and they ponder about what used to be. And it's just a collection of historical things. I'm all for history. And I'm all for staying connected to the past because we'll veer off course if we don't. I'm going to tell you something. Pentecost uh, is not a movement. I'm not calling it a religion. Pentecost is not a movement uh, of what used to be. It's not a movement of, hey, look at our heritage. Although I'm proud of our heritage, understand what I'm saying in context of morning but it's a now they called it the book of acts uh, not the book of church history they called it the book of acts uh, they called it the book of things that were done the book of what people were doing hey let's write the next chapter of the book of acts Got them already hot. watch out it might go off if we're not vigilant we're going to be living in nostalgia rather than purpose. If we're not careful, we'll be having reminiscences rather than revival. Now, we're at a critical moment. We're at a crossroads. We are standing before a window of opportunity, a door of opportunity that will not forever remain open. So I say this morning, Peak, hear the Spirit calling. And I want to say this, there is a voice of the Spirit that is very present, even deeper than just, even deeper than just what is preached, even deeper than just what is sung and what is said. There is a work of the Spirit that is going on. There is an undercurrent that runs through everything that we're doing here at Peak. I came across some uh, compelling information that I want to share with you here just a little bit, and I'm watching the time. Hey, where's all the folks from Newport? Yeah. This is how we, those people are crazy. I think they draw their blood and make cocaine out of it. Man, we had church at Newport, and they were crazy. They had their ties wrapped around their head. Those people. But I love preaching at Newport. If you've never preached at Newport, fake it and act like you can preach so Brother Earth's going to invite you there. <laughs> uh, any, let's move on. <clears throat> Sociologists, these are the people that study society. In Greek, society means society. Um, Sociologists. Hey, don't you know people always throw out in Greek, you know, in Greek it means, and the Hebrew means this, and I do that too, but it boils down to it meant what we said anyway. That's why we have an English version of the Bible. I got to get over here behind the pulpit and pull my pants up again. It's ridiculous. I haven't seen my feet in 30 years. <laughs> After I ever lost weight, I think somebody was following me. <laughs> oh, my wife says, don't get up and make fat jokes. I'm saying, I'm just saying what everybody's thinking. <laughs> get over that. <laughs> Where, you guys are messing me up. I'm going to tell you something. You think preaching hard's because of the crowd out there? No. Preaching is these guys up here. They got all kinds of stuff they're saying, all kinds of scriptures they're wanting you to quote, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, oh, my God, you ought to hear it. Hey, batter, 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 batter. That's what it reminds me of. Sociologists gathered information about the cycle of the rise and decline of movements. Basically, it's four points, but, and it applies to politics business, churches, whatever. It, it, it applies to many different areas. The, the, the first generation, the origin, is usually 
a revolution or an awakening of some kind. Think of the Renaissance, the Great Awakening, whatever. Go on. That is usually what the first generation is, the originating cause. The second stage of a movement, whatever it is, political, business, religious, whatever. The second is organization. They bring process. They bring structure. The third is education. This is the intellectual property of the movement, bringing the intellect, the, the, the knowledge, uh, bringing together all the knowledge of the movement, whatever it might be. Now, the fourth, the fourth is the socialization of whatever the movement may be. And this is the stage where self-perpetuation, <clears throat> now listen closely here. The fourth is the stage where there's a deciding factor it's going to fall one way or the other. The fourth stage is opportunity or erosion. Because in the fourth stage, once you read that stage of socialization, if we're not careful, instead of the movement going on, now I'm just reading to you what the sociologist said. This is the stage where <clears throat> self-perpetuation of the organization be of the movement, you know, that was, the, we're going back to the second stage now, becomes the focus rather than the core inspiration of the movement. The first generation gives birth to the movement. The second maximizes what the first generation set up, and from there they take it even higher, many times to the pinnacle. The third generation, so to speak, or the third stage, whatever you want to call it, is <clears throat> at the height of the movement, they build the structure. They build the structure. But they do not necessarily take it further. Many times the high point is where the movement settles. Okay? And then the, the fourth, the fourth usually declines to losing the spirit and intent of the original movement, the original stage. And this is where stagnation and erosion, erosion, their terminology, erosion of originating purpose set in until either the movement's demise or, render, and this is business, whatever it might be, or rendering it unrecognizable as compared to its origin. We have the John Wesley. You ever heard of John Wesley? Anybody heard of John Wesley? John Wesley, <clears throat> you think some of our standards are tight? You ought to have heard some of the stuff John Wesley come up with. They preach against everything but fresh air. John Wesley's movement today will ordain gays and lesbians to the ministry. Totally unrecognizable. Totally unrecognizable from its origin. And they say the reason why the fourth stage, I want to repeat this just a moment, and I'm fixing to get rolling here. The reason why the fourth stage is so important is because that's where self-perpetuation takes on greater meaning than the originating cause. Now, you apply this to the church. And uh, I don't want to mention the name of the denomination, but there was a denomination that was named. It's been around for many, many, many years in, in America. But um, they, they, were, they centered on this. They were talking about business and everything else, but when they got to the religious part of it, they centered on this denomination. They said the first generation, the ones who give birth to the movement, they are very God-centered. They are unprocessed and pure. They are organic not that I'm any kind of expert on organic, but if you know what I'm saying. And whenever they come up with an organic snicker bar, I'm there. But I mean organic in the sense of being unprocessed and undiluted with a lot of other materials mixed in. The second generation, their core, the movement is their life. The first stage, the movement is their life. Their life is defined by the movement. 
And they say what begins to happen in the very next generation is what the danger doesn't always happen. But the danger is this. They really don't have a relationship, the next stage, with the originating purpose. They have a relationship with the generation of the originating purpose. Now, the third generation usually falls into maintenance mode. But the sociologists said this in their study. When a generation falls into maintenance mode, maintenance mode is a first sign of degradation. When if we can just hold it together. And then usually the fourth generation inherits the decline. Now, young people... We can either ignore history or we can learn from it. Now, there are some startling news I have for you today, and I'm watching the clock. We are in a new cycle right now. As we sit here today in this building, in this service, and, and, and some folks may accuse me of being a little dramatic. I hope I'm not. I feel like God has dealt with me, and I'm just speaking to you what I feel. This is not just a conference we're having here today because uh, we've got a new organization we are trying to further. This is not just a youth conference we've gathered here today just because we need something to do. I'm going to tell you in my heart, I feel like there's something that is going on in the Spirit. Uh, I feel like there is a voice of God uh, that is calling out to another generation. I want you to look around and notice, as I mentioned already, we've got some champions among us, uh, and they're getting gray and they're getting a little weary with that sword they're not compromising they're not backing up but i'm going to tell you something we need another generation of champions we need another generation that goes back to the first experience to the originating cause and taps in to the spirit of the original inspiration Paul said it like this, I charge thee before God. Where's my handkerchief? There, I got it, I got it. I got it, yours has cooties. Hey, Brother Anthony, he doesn't tell anybody, he uses the same handkerchief all week for all the preachers. That's his way of getting back for having to run errands. Paul said it like this to Timothy, I charge thee before God. He used the word charge. I don't mean, you know, visa. I charge thee. Okay, can I just be me? I am sick and tired of being careful about some stuff. I'm tired of it. I'm fed up with being careful about stuff. I'm just going to tell you, we've been tiptoeing around and trying to be diplomatic, and we've lost a whole generation. Somebody stand up and say something. Somebody get worked up. Somebody get red-faced. Somebody get radical. Somebody get bold. Somebody stand up and be a voice for this generation. I mean what I'm saying. Paul looked at Timothy and he said, I charge you. This is not a suggestion. This is not a maybe so. I'm telling you. He said, preach the word. Give it to them. Suck them right between the eyes. I'm sorry, but the diplomacy has not worked and the carefulness has not worked and I'm grieved to say it there's a whole generation of apostolic young people that are lost because somebody was afraid somebody else might be bothered shut up and speak the word say it say it say it say it preach it
Listen to me. I'm going to say something that may make some people nervous. I'm ready for a new generation. I don't even know if some of you younger ones, and I don't say this condescendingly. I'm just pointing something out. I don't even know if some of you younger ones understand the terminology when I say closed line preaching. Closed line preaching. I'm ready for some more closed line preaching. I'm going to tell you something. I'm so ready for it. I've had guys come and preach at my church and preach against stuff that I don't preach against. But you know what? I'm glad they're there and I'm glad they're saying it. Because I'm telling you what, the, ambigu- the, the ambiguous preaching hasn't gotten us anything but an emergent church. The ambiguous preaching hasn't gotten us anything but a generation that has lost their Pentecostal identity. The ambiguous, uh, unspecified preaching hasn't gotten us anything. I'm going to tell you something. I'm ready for some... Hey, hey, we've got to get over something. We've got to get over this notion that doctrinal preaching and holiness preaching are... That's for the elders. I'll tell you what I'm ready for. I'm ready for some 18-year-olds and some 20-year-olds and some 22-year-olds and some 16-year-olds to get up and let her rip. Preach about iTunes. Preach about rock music. Preach about short skirts. Preach it. Preach about plunging necklines. Preach about slits up to the higgy mo high. Let loose, turn loose, and preach it. Go somewhere and preach a week on the oneness of God. Go somewhere and preach a week on Acts 238. Go somewhere and preach about it. And I mean name it. I mean say it. Don't just use the word holiness. Say it. And I'm going to tell you what else. We, preachers. Elders, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not out of line. But listen to me. I don't mind going to a conference and somebody preaching it tougher than what I preach it. I don't mind going somewhere and somebody squishing my toes and making me a little uncomfortable and making me look around and wonder, man, am I being careful enough? Am I watching it enough? I'm going to tell you young people something. You're going to have to learn how to preach about YouTube. You're going to have to learn how to preach about MySpace and Facebook. And I'm not trying to be your pastor and tell you to get off. But I'm telling you, you are going to face a a media generation like no one has ever faced. You're going to face some stuff like none of us have ever faced. It is a digital movie generation. And you're going to have to get a hold of something and know where you are and know where you stand and revolt. I mean revolt against the compromise. I'm talking about defy the decline. Stand there and thumb your nose and say, we ain't going there with you. I'm talking about young men that are not afraid to preach about jewelry. Not afraid to preach about movies. I don't care how they're delivered. I don't care if it's an iPod. I don't care what it is or a phone. You're not afraid to preach against Hollywood. Somebody get over it today. I'm talking about today. And I know what some people are thinking. I know. Now, if we're not careful, and I understand this. You see, one of the hard things about preaching, you can't preach everything. Now, if you're Brother Booker, you go ahead and do it. But a lot of us can't preach everything. Sorry, Brother Booker. I will be done in one CD. You watch. They will not have to be hauling into the hard drive for me. <laughs> Brother Morton, that kind of preaching is going to make these guys a bunch of radicals. 
You guys remember the term red face radicals? Remember red face radicals? I say let's go beyond red face. Let's go to purple. Let's get some purple face radicals. How about that? Hey, why, why not? We tried the other stuff and it ain't working. It's all down the commode. I say let's get out there and tear up Jack. I say bring on the revolution, friend. Bring on the revolution. And I know there may be some current concern. I'm way off my notes. I know there may be some concern about some young guns getting overzealous. I understand. Hear me. Listen to me. And I didn't get this from a book. I didn't get this from T.D. Jakes. I didn't get this from Joel Olstein. And you say, well, you're talking behind his back. You bring the boy in here. You bring me to him, and I'll tell him straight up. Hey, you want me to tell you something? What's his head? Joel Olstein, pastor on the, it might be the largest church in, in the United States. It, yeah. I mean, if we're going to go by numbers, Catholics have us all beat. Let's go, you know, have mass. Joel Olstein went on the Larry King show. I don't even know what that is, but Mills told me about it. Hey, hey, right here, Devon Mills, Brother Miles Young, are they two some of the best worship leaders that we've got? I'm telling you, if they were in the world, they'd be rock stars. Brother Young said he thought I was going to do a Jenny Craig commercial before and after. <laughs> Oh, what's his head? Olstein. And believe me or not, I'm almost done. Olstein goes on. Larry King show. He would not mention the word hell. And he would not say the word sinner. And he would not say the word, what was the other word? Oh, lost. He wouldn't say that. Whew, we've got problems, folks. But not in here. I want you, I want some of you ministers to look at this. Look at this. We're throwing raw meat out there and they want more. Some of y'all got blood running down your chin. Feed it to us. I'm going to tell you what. This mild-mannered apostolicism, if it's even a word, has not paid off. It hasn't saved anybody. We've lost. I say stand up and revolt. I say defy the decline. I don't care what history determines. I don't care what history says. You're looking at a fourth generation with a first generation purpose. And some may worry about some young guns getting overzealous. Now hear me. I would rather try to temper someone's zeal than try to reverse their compromise. We can teach wisdom to some old boy that's tearing churches up. But I've been there, buddy. I'm going to tell you, these hands uh, have tried to fix the wreckage uh, of those that don't have a revelation of the oneness of God. And Acts 2.38, and think that it's all right for a woman to cut her hair. And think it's all right for a woman to wear jewelry and dress immodestly and all that junk. Uh, and let's be emergent. I have tried to help. Uh, and I'm telling you, they're beyond repair. They're to a place where we can't fix them. I'm going to tell you, we can teach you wisdom and how to preach but if you decide to compromise if you decide to turn back on this message I can't help you he charged Timothy he said preach the word preach the word preach the word
young men, we need to learn how to preach the oneness of God. We need to learn how to preach holiness issues. I don't mean holiness ambiguous. I mean holiness issues. The reason why we have convictions against sports is because somebody got up and didn't say, well, we believe in holiness. They said, we believe in not being involved in sports. And listen, I'm not trying to cause any pastor any problem. And I'm not trying to pass to you. If I say something's crosswise with your pastor, you go to your pastor with a good spirit and you work with him. I'm not your pastor. But I am preaching in this pulpit this morning. And I tell you what grieves me. I'm grieved and angered. Yes, angered. That is, I'm going to say it plainer than that. I'm mad. I'm mad because I, there's a, I've seen seas of young people like we're seeing here this morning. And they're lost to this morning. They're in false doctrine. Because somebody didn't have the guts to stand up and say something and make it plain. Hear me, preacher. These young people can take it, preach it, straight, name it, say it. There's a lot of young people here from California. Some of you even know the young man I'm talking about. But I'm not going to mention his name. But he was raised in a church that teaches truth. Now he's in a church in false doctrine. And I was just at a meeting and he was there. And it grieved my heart. I'm going to tell you what bugged me more. I tell you what bugged me more than seeing him. And, and I want to reach out and help if I can. I'm not talking about being ugly and belligerent and squishing people when they're down. I'm not talking about that. But I'm going to tell you something. And I can't explain everything this morning. But there's a place you don't fool around with false doctrine. You don't fool around with compromise. Hey, I'm going to say it plain. Wait, be quiet just a second. I'm going to say it plain. And I want to make sure this gets on the audio. There is not another way to be saved than Acts 2.38. There is not another message of salvation. I don't care who says what. I don't care if the Baptists are doing as well as they can and the Assemblies of God believing in talking in tongues. There is one way to be saved, and that is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something else. This is not a suggestion. It's a command. Here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one. He went on and told Timothy, but watch thou in some things. Watch thou in the things you agree with. Watch thou in the things that won't offend people. Watch thou in all things. I'm going to tell you something. Your preacher is charged by God to watch everything. He, well, he's just breathing down my neck, and I'm not for being a tyrant and a dictator, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. Uh, God put the, church, the preacher in the church for a reason. It's not to make sure your feathers don't get ruffled or your mom and daddy don't get upset and quit paying their tithes. Uh, sometimes he may have to get up in your grill and twist your tail and tell you you ain't dressing like that. You ain't wearing your shirt that your skirt that short. You ain't wearing your sleeves that short. You're not wearing your neckline that low. You're not putting that makeup on your face. You're not coloring your hair. You're not listening to that kind of music. You're not putting your jewelry on. You're not acting like that. You're not watching that. You're not listening to that. Watch thou in all things. Whew. You know another reason why I don't preach long? Too fat. You know another reason why I don't go down no stairs? I don't know if I'll get back up. One trip per service is good enough. 
But after he told them, preach the word. Watch down all things. Hey, you know what cracks me up? People say, man, I wish I lived back in the days of Paul. Man, I wish Paul was my pastor. Yeah, you do. I wish Peter was my pastor. You, you know what? Can I just be plain? Can I do it Morton style? Yeah, that's just stupid. That's not unlearned. That's stupid. Unlearned is a sophisticated way of saying you're ignorant. When Peter got crossed up with somebody not giving all their offering, they died. Yeah, you want Peter to be your pastor. Keep holding your check back, and if Peter's your pastor, you're going to die. And you know what else? <laughs> I told Joe Booker before the service, I said, I feel like the fat guy's jumping in the pool. There's going to be a big old something going on. Paul, you want Paul to be your pastor? Have you ever thought about something? In 1 Corinthians, when he was dogging that dude for committing adultery with his father's wife, do you realize they read that in front of the whole church? They read that letter in front of the whole church. And old Bubba, whatever his name was, in Greek it was Bubba Mias, whatever it was. <laughs> He's sitting there. And they start reading this letter about fornicators such as not been named. And old Bubba's sliding down in his chair because it's getting real uncomfortable. Yeah, you want Paul to be your pastor. Somebody got all crossways with Paul, and he turned around and struck them blind. We'd all be going around like this if Paul was our pastor nowadays. We'd be having this service in Braille. Okay, he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. <laughs> oh, I've really messed myself up, because now I need to give you something in the Greek. This present, he meant he loved now. What was going on around him right now was fine with him. He would let that define him. He would let that guide and direct him. I'm going to tell you, he lost touch with the world to which God had called him. But hear me. There is an attitude. There is a spirit that reverses the process of generational decline. And I'm, I feel like that spirit is in this house this morning. I look out here and I see faces. And I feel spirits. And I see young people crowded around ready to go. I'm going to tell you, we've got in this building right now what it takes to reverse the decline. And I'm going to go a step further than that. I don't mean just not compromising. I mean having revival in the midst of the decline. I don't mean holding up in a bunker and making it to heaven. I'm talking about busting out. Busting out. Living it out loud. I'm talking about busting out and living it out loud and getting out there and causing a revolt. Like they said in the book of Acts, they that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. You want to know? Hey, you gave me an idea the other day. You want to know where to start your revolt? You know, back in their day, they went down to the temple, the street corner, the seashore, whatever, and they got stuff stirred up. I'm going to tell you where your street corner is. It's on the internet. Now listen, if your pastor preaches against it, don't do it. You can ignore the little fat guy right now if your pastor preaches against it. But the internet's here, and a lot of us are hopefully using it right with a, you know, you know what I mean. But hear me. They're out there spewing their stuff. They're out there putting their false doctrine on it. They're out there trying to chase us back into a hole with their blogs and their posts and their whatever. And I'm not in favor of chat rooms. I'm not in favor of all that anonymous contact stuff that gets us in trouble. I don't mean that. I'm not talking about gospel and all that. But I'm going to tell you something. They're not the only one that can get on the corner. They don't own that corner. 
Somebody get out there and start a blog about the oneness of God. Somebody get out there and start a blog about Acts 2.38 being the only way to be saved. Somebody get out there and start a blog about holiness dress and holiness living and holiness character. Somebody get out there on the street and defy the decline. Joshua, I'm closing. Uh, musicians come. Joshua did not get where he was just because all of a sudden he was in some position. Like I said, I don't know where it happened the first time, but something happened. Something transferred between he and Moses. And there's an incident that I, I was going to read a lot more to, but I'm going to give it to you quick. The people had sinned and started worshiping the, the, the golden calf idol, and Moses tore up Jack and then decided, okay, i got to go ask God what to do. So he goes up to the tabernacle, and the glory cloud comes down. God visits with him face to face. And the Bible says that Moses turned back to the camp. But it says this here. It says, but Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. The reason why he got to be the conqueror of Joshua and Judges is because of Exodus 33. When he saw something happen between God and Moses and said, I got to get me some of that. I got to get that. Moses, you go on. Moses, you go take care of what you got to take care of. But I've got to tap into that. I've got to tap into that. There was something that awakened within Joshua and said, that's it. That's what will take us into the promised land. That's where Moses' effectiveness is. That's where Moses' victory is. That's where Moses' leadership is. It was in a generational relationship. It was in a transference. Woo! The odds of historical decline are against us. But if God be for us, if God be for us, if God be for us, I'm looking for some young men and young women. Not just here at Peak, but in your home church, in your hometown, we'll stand flat-footed and say, no way, friend, we're not moving from here. In fact, we're going on from here. We're not only going to not compromise, we're going to take territory. We're going to take possession. We're going to conquer. We're not only going to survive in the wilderness on manna, we're going we're gonna to conquer. We're going to take cities. We're going to stir up a little dust. We're going to revolt against the decline. Abraham, Isaac, and Esau is what it should have been. Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But we know it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because something in Jacob said, okay, Esau, you don't want it? Next. Next. I'll take it. Jacob grabbed a hold of what not should have been and made it what it was. He took a hold of what's not what this wasn't what it was meant to be, and he made it what it was. He said, My generation, my generation. It was Jacob that wrestled an angel. Esau was going off what grandpa and daddy passed on. Jacob pushed through all that. He said, No. I want you to change my name. I want you to change my name. I want you to do something in me.
Let's let the Holy Ghost talk to us just a minute. Peak. Find your voice. Find your voice. Find your champions. In fact, he said it like this. He said, I will not drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left. will not drive them out that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did brother Godair brother Coombe, brother Odom brother Booker brother Ken Godair there are some things some battles you're not going to win because their battles reserved for this generation. God is not going. There were nations left. There was unconquered territory the day Joshua died. Because God made a decision. Not Joshua. It wasn't Joshua's weakness nor his contemporaries. God made a decision. I want every generation to be scarred. I want every gen. I feel the Holy Ghost in here right now. I want every generation to hear the ring of clashing armor and know the flash of the sword and the running of blood. A young man stood and two kings that had killed his countrymen and family stood before him and his father said draw your sword and fall on him and kill him now I'm not talking about having a vicious ugly attitude don't anybody read that into what I'm saying but I am talking about not compromising. And not only not compromising. I know I keep saying this, but I feel it. Not only not compromising, but taking territory and having revival. Hold on. Hold on. Zeban Zalmunna stood before the son of Gideon. And he couldn't do it. Please, young people, go dig it out somewhere in prayer room. Go fight it out somewhere. Please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Champions are not made at conferences. They're made in obscure places with a lion hide and a bear hide on the wall. You cannot have what you need to have unless you're willing to be scarred to get it. 
The reason why David had mighty men is because he looked. He saw old slash marks. He saw, he saw the remnants of broken bones and pieces of hair missing. Why? Because he, he said, I'll make an army out of the scarred. I'll make an army out of those that are scarred. Out of those that know what it means to take a blow. Let's pray. I don't know what else to do right now, but just pray. I feel the voice of the Holy Ghost calling right now. Demas! You're not the only representative of this generation, Demas. Because Paul said, okay, Demas, you go on and do what you want. Mark! Mark, where are you? Because I found in you, Mark, the inspiration for the generation that I need. Oh, God's calling some Marks here this morning. God's calling some Jacobs that'll stand up and take Esau's place. Come on, all over this building, it's altar call time. It's altar call time. Defy the decline. I will not look for ways to fudge and compromise. I will not look for ways to fudge on what my pastor's saying. I will look for ways to be stronger. I will look for ways. Come on, young people, all over the house. All over the house. Come on. Let's just pray. Take Let's just seek the Lord. That holy the devil can cite scripture for his purpose, said William Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice. There are many out there who simply use one scripture to teach on baptism. Two noted examples. The Trinitarians used Matthew 28, 19 out of context for their baptismal formula. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And the Church of the Latter-day Saints or Mormons use 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to baptize for the dead, or what is called baptism by proxy. What else shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? However, we find that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. This was necessary under the law in the Old Testament. We read in Deuteronomy 17.6, At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And in the New Testament, Paul repeated this same principle. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Every single apostle used Jesus' name baptism as their sole name in their formula. Examples are the following scriptures. Mark 16, 15 through 17, Luke 24, 45 through 47, John 20, 23, Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, 12 through 16, Acts 10, 48, Acts 18 and 8, Acts 19 and 5, Acts 22, 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Romans 6, 3 through 5, Galatians 3 and 27. So nobody ever used a misapplied title baptism of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's because they knew the name of the Father was Jesus, and the Son was named Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was sent in Jesus' name. Peter said unto those people in the book of Acts, they should save themselves from this ungodly generation. That's in Acts 2.40. Are you willing to follow the word of Jesus and the faith of the apostles? Or be like those on the day of the Lord who claim Jesus was theirs, yet they were cast away because they were still in sin. In Matthew 7.21-23. God bless you as you obey his word.